European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. I think this is an important step to take uh, when we're addressing any uh, topic that has to do with nature because uh, Native Americans certainly knew how to coexist in harmony with nature. And it would be good for us to be inspired by that. So there are many kinds of birds in the world. If you were an ornithologist, you would have all these memorized and you'd know how to spell them too. <laughs> but uh, I'm not talking about all the kinds of birds in the world tonight. I'm just talking about songbirds. And if you go all the way to the bottom of this list, you'll see passeriformes. Those are the songbirds. They're called passerines or perching birds. Those are the true songbirds. It doesn't mean that some of these other birds don't make pleasing sounds, they do. But if you're an ornithologist, this is just uh, you know, one group of birds, the songbirds, and that's what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, here we have a family tree of all the birds, and here they are, the passerforms or songbirds at the top. Notice how parrots and songbirds are close cousins. Notice also how falcons are close cousins, cousins to both of them. And uh, who would have thought, right? And so if parrots and songbirds are close cousins, well, maybe they have something in, in common, namely their intelligence. Some of you might be familiar with Alex the Gray Parrot, who uh, was studied uh, and, uh, and had a relationship with, as you can see, Irene Pepperberg, a, a scientist who uh, proved to the world just how amazing uh, parents could be, both in terms of their intelligence. She taught uh, this parrot how to um, not only count, uh, and uh, get, but also to speak and gave it a, a pretty considerable vocabulary. So, Par uh, so Alex himself said at the end of uh, every evening with her and his last words were, you be good, I love you, see you tomorrow. Songbirds, passerines have an anisodactyl toe arrangement, three claws in front, one in back, 12 tail feathers. Uh, and a syrinx above their lungs. Now we have a larynx, it's in our throats. You can feel it vibrate when you sing or hum or speak. Uh, but birds have, uh, songbirds have a syrinx way down, as you can see, right above the lungs. And in this illustration, this diagram here of the syrinx, you can see there are two branches. You are going to hear later in this presentation, a bird harmonizing with itself because songbirds are actually able to independently control the two branches of their syrinx and produce different sounds uh, from each branch. And they have the brains to, uh, to handle such a complex syrinx. This is a song oh. brain on the left. Uh, uh, someone needs to mute back there, uh, out, out there in, in uh, computer land. If you could, or cell phone. Yeah, someone needs to mute. I think, I think it's Bert. Bert, can you mute please? Bert Christopic? Yes. Uh, could you please uh, mute your uh, presentation, your, mute your cell phone or computer? Uh, you're using? Me, I, you. I just want to say I got it. So songbirds have very complex brains handling uh, auditory input and output compared to a non songbird brain. Uh, usually colored, often speckled eggs. There are exceptions that we can think about a robin's egg, which is colored but not speckled. Uh, and songbirds are altricial. Now, the, altricial is the opposite of precocial. So altricial, uh, humans are the most altricial animal on the planet because we are so helpless for so long, and dependent on our parents or, or, or adults to pay, take care of us. So songbirds also are blind, featherless, and helpless at birth but it doesn't take long for them to fledge and be independent. And we don't need to be able to see to be able to appreciate birds. Here's a photograph of a, a, a Association for the Blind field trip. Um, bird watching is certainly a very popular pastime in the United States and elsewhere. Fastest growing outdoor activity. 51 million Americans are bird watchers and that's probably just a, uh, you know, an underestimate in, in terms of being officially a, a bird watcher, but aren't we all? People of all ages can do it. It's a healthy activity, low cost activity, lifetime activity, can be done anywhere. And it's good for the environment because the more people who, who are uh, paying attention to the environment, the more uh, activists we have to protect the environment. Uh, you can check out any of these uh, organizations. 
uh, Connecticut Ornitholog Ornithological Association, the Western Connecticut Bird Club, the New Haven Bird Club, and see if, uh, if you want to. Uh, there's, there's certainly no, nothing like learning from other birders, and I'm sure you would find plenty of birders in these three groups. On to the show. This is the first bird that I want to talk about. Eastern wood pea is one of the primitive group of birds called the sub -Ossines. Uh, So uh, what's, what's different about these uh, sub birds is they uh, don't need to learn their song. They, can, they actually sing it from, uh, uh, from by instinct, um, and they don't even need to hear an adult sing it uh, for, in order for them to be able to sing it. Now, these are sonograms here. Here's the peewee saying, pee-ah-wee. He's saying his own name. Notice I did not say pee-ah-ee-ah-wee because that's what it looks like in this, song, in this sonogram. You, all you're going to hear is pee-ah-wee because that is such a small interval that it's going by in a blur to our ears. Now, and as I play it, I think I'll, I'll be able to demonstrate what I'm talking about. And then you'll hear Excuse it say me, John. John, yes. um, there's yes. some people in the waiting room. Could you uh, let them in? I guess they are still. In the okay, room. so in order to do that, I have to stop screen sharing, or how yes. do I do that? Yeah, okay. there should be a, yeah. And then, uh, do to do, admit, admit, yeah. admit. Right. Okay, admit. Good enough. All right, back to screen sharing. Anyone else need to be admitted? There would be a list, I think. So okay. you admitted who was in there. I think you're okay. Okay, so here we are, the recording of the Eastern Wood Peewee. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know what the problem is. I've gotten my earphones plugged into it. Now let's, okay, let's go back. There it is, Peewee. Again, pee ah we we you now notice you, there is a very abrupt uh, rise in pitch there that you did not hear because it just went by in a blur, right? Pee ah we ah uh, did he we you well there you have it. Uh, the song of the pee, wood peewee singing his own thing, and we also have uh, here uh, the birds have a. The, the nests uh, have taken on them sometimes with a speckled wing. And uh, here is an Eastern Phoebe. He also says his own name. Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. And if you see a bird, here it is, Phoebe, Phoebe. And if you see a bird bobbing its tail up and down, you are looking at the Eastern Phoebe. Truly uh, a harbinger of spring. You don't see them in the winter. They migrate and return here every spring. Crested flycatcher is the largest of the pirate flycatcher family and pretty unusual song. I don't know if you would want to call it a song. Very simple because th these are among the more primitive of the songbirds. This is the largest of the giant flycatchers. Uh, if you can find a snake skin, he will adorn his nest with that snake skin in order to make it look like it's dangerous territory to predators, <laughs> to other predators. But this is just a matter of instinct for him. It's not a, it's not a question of, uh, oh, he's an intelligent bird. He's, he's figured something out. Now, the Eastern kingbird, Tyrannus, Tyrannus. Can you imagine what would possess an ornithologist to name a bird Tyrannus Tyrannus and why it would have a common name of kingbird? I will explain. This is a fairly small bird. There's nothing uh, obviously uh, vicious about him. You know, not very intimidating. Uh, but the kingbird knows what to do. The male kingbird, if he sees a large bird circling up above, uh, uh, where his mate is uh, rooting, or, you know, uh, taking care of the, the chicks, he is going to spring into action. And just like Clark Kent changing into Superman, well, he's, he's got this red uh, crest that he's going to show on his head. He's going to spring up, uh, you know, fly up into the air, and then above that offending bird, and then land on its back and peck on its head mercilessly until that bird has decided 
uh, I'd better get out of here and leaves the area where his mate is nesting. This is a very, this bird has a very strong sense of territoriality and birds, some kinds of birds mob other birds, you know, uh, numbers of them will mob. Kingbird doesn't need any other kingbirds, he does it all by himself. And even the bald eagle uh, <laughs> is, uh, it, it has, is told to vamoose when he is near the kingbird nest. In fact, I've heard one story, and I'm sure it's true, that a kingbird saw a small airplane and, and, and uh, <laughs> went to chase it. <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure he believed that he won the encounter because the plane kept going. Now we have another uh, formidable bird. This one's called the Northern Shrike. Just check out that black mask. Uh, and it's also called the butcher bird. Why? Because uh, this bird not only eats insects, which so many other birds do, but a uh, big part of its diet is small rodents like shrews, voles, moles, and mice. It will also catch and eat snakes and other birds. And it will line up corpses, one right next to the other on, uh, on a branch or on a barbed wire fence. That's why he's called the butcher bird. You will only see the Northern Shrike in, in, in uh, New England in the wintertime. Uh, you, you pretty much have to be a birder to see him at all. I don't think I've ever seen a Northern Shrike. So, uh, but I'm keeping my eyes peeled. The red-eyed vireo is more often seen, um, more often heard rather than seen. Some people call him the preacher bird because he just doesn't know when to shut up. And it, it says, here am I, where are you? Here am I, where are you? over and over and over again. So uh, let's see here. Here we go. Here am I. Where are you? Here am I. Here. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, well, you probably have heard the preacher bird going on and on and on throughout the day. You, you know, it's, it's not just the dawn chorus when, when you know, a lot of birds are singing the dawn. It's throughout the day, thousands of times in one day, uh, a red-eyed vireo is capable of, you know, continuing with, almost with no interruption. And the warbling vireo. I don't know if that sounds like a warble to you, but that's what it's called, warbling vireo. And the blue jay. <laughs> now, you can't tell a male from a female blue jay. Uh, because they're a, a member of the corvidae, which is the crows and the jays together. So think of the blue jay as a fancy crow. Toronto. So isn't that remarkable? There are so many sounds. Uh, that's all part of the Blue Jays repertoire. I would not call those sounds song. I would call them communication because I'm sure they all mean something. Uh, when a Blue Jay makes any of those sounds, uh, they are communicating. They're giving information to other members of their flock and they are very social birds. Both male and female take care of the young. In fact, the older brothers and sisters of these chicks might well join in and help to protect or feed their younger sibs. Uh, that's just how tight-knit these social groups are. Very intelligent birds, and uh, they, they can also uh, be pretty destructive of, uh, they can rob nests and, and chicks of other species of birds uh, and do so pretty effectively. American Crow. Let's take a, uh, let's listen to this recording now.
Let's see. I hope you're impressed. That is the repertoire of the American Crow. Again, I'm sure it's not complete. Again, I'm sure those are communications, not, not simple songs of territoriality or that sort of thing. Uh, I've heard that crows and, and other corvids can actually sound quite tender when they are being romantic and communicating with their partner. Uh, crows can also mourn when one of their uh, flock uh, is, dies. They, they are seen, uh, and there's, there's no question about it, the behavior and the sounds and the postures of these birds, they are gathering around the corpse of their, uh, their friend who's just passed, uh, and you can tell that they are mourning. Uh, crows can count. Uh, crows can remember phenomenally well. They can, if, if they decide that they don't trust you and they see you uh, like decades later, not only, uh, uh, and they do have long lives sometimes, by the way, uh, maybe not decades necessarily, but in captivity, they can live as long as 40, 48 years, uh, not so long in the wild. Uh, but uh, they will teach their young uh, to distrust someone uh, if they are, are satisfied that, they, that this is important for, them, for the young to know. And then the young will remember that for the rest of their lives, not even knowing why they should not trust them, but they just trust their parents' uh, judgment. Uh, crows can be quite uh, inventive. They can make and use tools. There have been a number of cases of that. Uh, they can be uh, uh, playful. Uh, speaking of being play playful, the, the raven has been seen. This is the largest of the songbirds now, the common raven. Uh, ravens have been seen to fly upside down for a half mile. Uh, here, incidentally, if you want to know how to tell a raven from a crow, besides the fact that they're bigger, but you may not be able to tell at a distance whether it's a raven or a crow, here's the silhouette of a raven and compare that to the silhouette of a crow. Notice, notice in particular the tail of the crow and then compare that <coughs> tail of the raven. Uh, also, uh, the behavior in flight, a raven soars. Uh, much more than a crow is able to. And in that, in that way, he, he will look a little bit like a bird of prey, although he's not. Look also at that massive beak and that bumpy head, very distinctive bird. And let's listen now to recordings of raven. Ravens sound like crows with a sore throat. <laughs> Uh, Donna Desimone, if you could turn off, if you could mute, please. What would you like me to do? Please mute. I don't know. Let's see. Down, down to the lower left corner, can you see where it says mute? Um, and, uh, also, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I lost track here. <laughs> All right, so this is the raven. Ravens like high, high places. Ravens and crows don't like each other very much. Uh, and ravens will prevail if, uh, if their numbers are about equal because they're bigger and stronger. <laughs> the crows can sometimes simply outnumber them. Uh, Ray, could you mute yourself, please? Uh, and so here we have Purple Martin, the largest of the crows. Uh, and certainly one of the most popular. Uh, and people, uh, people know that if they want to have, um, if they want to have uh, Purple Martins, they have to provide uh, suitable quarters like this, uh, this uh, Purple Martin house. The tree swallow is the most common uh, swallow in the world. They travel many miles, they fly many miles a day, 
zooming acrobatically around uh, the sky, uh, pivoting with, with amazing skill and, and the catching birds, catching insects on the fly. The remarkable bird, the cliff swallow, able to uh, make its own nest out of mud. And the barn swallow, they're boring. Uh, this is not done. Ray Archaki, could you mute a few? Are you done? The back swallow. Interesting place to put a uh, to put a nest in, right there in the side of a bank. And the black cap chickadee. Uh, every, whoop, let's see. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, black cap chickadee says, "Hey, sweetie. Hey, sweetie." There's the sonogram saying, "Hey, sweetie." This is the signature song of the black cap chickadee, unless that black cap chickadee lives in Martha's Vineyard. Then instead of "Hey, sweetie." Oh, and this, here's the uh, chickadee dee dee. That's, a, that's the alarm sound. Uh, but here's what he sounds like on Martha's Vineyard. Sweetie, hey. Sweetie, hey. So it's the Martha's Vineyard dialect. And this is not the only bird that uh, will sound different depending on where he's, he lives. And uh, people can uh, often tame black cap chickadees quite easily. They, they seem to be quite bold and quite curious and, and inquisitive. They'll come right up to you. It won't be long before they can come and, uh, and, and in fact, if you go to Ipswich uh, Sanctuary, which is north of Boston, uh, not have been sanctuary, all the birds are already tame, not just the black capped chickadees, but the tufted titmice and others. And so uh, you don't have to tame them, they'll come right to you. Uh, speaking of tufted titmouse, here it is. They quite closely related to the black capped chickadee. And the tufted titmouse says, what, 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 what? <whistles> no, tufted says, Peter, Peter, Peter. I was, um, I was confusing it with a, a different bird. Peter, 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 Peter. <whistles> tufted says a lot of other things besides Peter, Peter, Peter. Sometimes if you hear a song in the, in the woods and you don't know what it is, it might be a tufted. <laughs> Simply because they're so common and they have such a large repertoire. Uh, Red breast of nuthatch. Small bird, but a loud song. Sounds like a toy horn. They, they line the hole uh, in the cavity that where they're nesting uh, with pitch or rosin so that others to, to deter uh, predators unlike from coming in. And the white breasted nut hatch. And here's the one that says what 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 the white breasted nut hatch goes down uh, upside down down a tree. You can call it the upside down bird. And why is it going down a tree? It's looking for food. Because there might be some, uh, an interesting, uh, appealing morsel of, of protein or what have you, uh, inside the, uh, in a crack in the bark. And the only way he's gonna find it, or she, is going down the bark, down the tree to look for it. And here is a bird that goes up a tree trunk to look underneath the bark to see what it can find to eat. It's the brown creeper and it will spiral around the tree. It'll start at the base of the tree and then uh, just climb up the tree, spiraling around the tree, looking up uh, and underneath those pieces of bark to see what might be, uh, what, what might be edible. Carolina Wren, a very endearing little bird. The, the uh, tail sticking straight up, kind of a lickety split, kind of <laughs> almost a, Sounds like a, a galloping song. Carolina Wren. They nest in the most improbable of places, like a, someone's boot inside a 
tool shed or in a bag of clothespins on the line or something like that. And how about the house wren? Probable Latin name of troglodytes they done. A lot of sound crammed into a small space of, of uh, time there. But if you think this is an impressively complex song, wait until you hear the winter wren. Mm. Is that amazing? I'm going to play it for you again. That is one complex song. I'm a, I'm a musician, if, and if you gave me a, a score and told me to play it on my saxophone or my flute, I would say, right, <laughs> and I would hand it back to you. <laughs> that is just an impossibly complex song. Uh, and don't forget, birds have syrinxes right above their lungs so they can, I'm sure this, this bird is using both sides of its syrinx uh, back and forth in, in some of these, like for example, right here, back and forth, back and forth. What an incredible, um, display of virtuosity by this bird. Golden crowned kinglet, a tiny, tiny bird, much smaller than a black capped chickadee. Prompter. <laughs> and then. Uh, Ruby crowned kinglet, the beautiful song that reminds me of spring. Ruby. Notice this one also has a red crest on its head. Only the male would have that crest, however, and only the male is singing. You might be aware that in most cases, it's the male that sings because males have two jobs to fulfill. One is to attract the female and the other is to protect the territory. There are some exceptions though. Sometimes females, of, of the females of, of some species do sing, um, or at least make calls. Now, everyone's favorite is the Eastern Bluebird. And the Bluebird actually is a thrush, a member of the Turtidae family. That more intense coloration of the male is the uh, breeding plumage in the spring. He looks more muted in coloration in the fall. And the female is on the left. You can get cool facts about any bird that you're interested in learning about from allaboutbirds.org, which is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology website. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm featuring this, um, I'm featuring this book here, Hello from Heaven by Bill and Judy Guggenheim, because so often uh, people report highly improbable encounters with animals that could be a butterfly, it could be a bird. Um, I personally met someone who had such an encounter uh, right after her father-in-law had passed. And uh, this, uh, her father-in-law loved bluebirds. And so after he passed, there was this bluebird that just showed up in a place that they've never seen bluebirds before and just stayed there and made its presence known. Uh, I have a scientific uh, background and I think of myself as a scientist. And I also believe that there's a lot that scientists don't know. And that uh, if, you're an, if you're a scientist, uh, worthy of the name, you should be open-minded to facts that, that perhaps might seem difficult to understand. There's no question to me, uh, uh, and I've, because I often share these kinds of stories with people, people share their stories with me. And uh, in fact, there, I, I met someone who worked at a store uh, where uh, bird seed and bird houses and that sort of thing were sold, books about birds, and she said people would share their stories, which are quite similar to those uh, that I've been describing uh, frequently, that a bird would be like an emissary uh, for, uh, uh, from, from heaven, from the afterlife, uh, of a loved one who had just passed. 
uh, and and having that experience, of course, is very reassuring and inspiring to to those of us who are still here. Uh, there it is, an eastern bluebird egg. Compare it to the size of a robin's egg and to a house wren's egg and the others and to a dime. Uh, it doesn't take long now for uh, these bluebird chicks to fledge. Just a matter of a couple of weeks and, and, and change and there they are out of the nest. These are not chicks, these are adult male, uh, male and female birds all roosting together, huddling together in the winter to stay warm. And here is a Peterson Bluebird box. I made this box uh, with the help of someone who's a lot more knowledgeable about woodworking than I. Uh, and uh, you can find this design on, online if you're curious. I highly recommend the, the metal flashing on top of the box because uh, otherwise that uh, box would disintegrate. Uh, it would rot and, and be useless within a matter of years. The, the flashing gives it a lifetime guarantee. Uh, notice also that there are holes in the side for ventilation. Uh, and um, the, the picture shows it resting on the ground, but of course you would, you would mount it somewhere uh, for, for occupation. Uh, it's also good to have a, a side of the box open up uh, for cleaning and for inspection. Um, so, and this would be a situation where, uh, you know, these, these bluebirds could roost and keep, it, keep themselves warm in this nesting box during winter, as well as use it during the summer to raise their young. Uh, while we're talking about birdhouses, please don't use or buy uh, bright colors because they, they do nothing but attract uh, the attention of animals that you don't want to be signaling and uh, advertising the existence of your birdhouse too. Birds like to be more secretive than that. Uh, also, please don't uh, provide them with a perch because birds don't need a perch. As you can see right there, that house sparrow doesn't need a perch at all. And the perch just gives some purchase, if you will, to uh, one of these animals that might like to make a meal of the chicks. It helps it helps it to get inside. You know, you don't want to encourage that. Mm. Other questions about birdhouse hygiene. Monitor every week. Uh, th that's the the highest standard. Uh, clean in mid August when uh, when it's, when they're all done raising their young. Nine to one solution of water to bleach. Rinse well and leave open to dry completely. Back to the show. Here's a very another thrush. The thrushes are among my favorite birds. Their songs are just so. Uh, now, well, let's see here. This would be, um, this is the beery. This is the beery. This is the hermit thrush. Notice how the song begins with a clear th whistle. A single whistle note and and then he erupts into swallows. What? A different kind in the world. Uh, Joe Porcaro, could you mute, please? Joe Joe Porcaro, could you mute, mute your, down there in the corner? And then finally, I, I promised you that you were going to hear. Um, oh, wait a minute. Okay, you were going to hear a bird harmonized with itself. The, har the recording that you're about to hear is at one-tenth speed. The reason it's slowed down is because you would not be able to hear the detail that I'm describing if it was at regular speed. So first you'll hear one side of the syrinx, uh, then you'll hear the other side of the syrinx, and then you will hear them both together in harmony. regular speed. I think of the wood thrush as America's nightingale. It 
it's interesting to note that some of the most beautiful sounding birds are also fairly plain colored. And some of the most uh, uh, colorful birds, uh, this is always the case, but sometimes the colorful birds uh, don't have such uh, extraordinary songs. There it is, the, uh, the recording of the, or the sonogram of the wood thrush. Notice how there are three, not two, but three separate notes being sung because the harmonic of the lower voice is also being produced by one side of the syrinx. Truly remarkable. Uh, it, it might surprise you to learn that the American robin is also a thrush. Uh, it does not have the kind of captivating song that you just heard, however. And this is the, uh, here's the, here's the robin. Cheerly, cheerio, 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 cheerly. Robins often nest on ledges. They don't need a cavity to nest on. Great catbird. This is one of the mimicking birds. And he can be quite talkative. It's not unusual for a catbird to come fairly close to the observer. Kind of like the black cat chickadee. Not, not very, quite curious and not very fearful. And they like to hang out in the shrubs. And listen, listen to this amazing variety uh, of, and there's the cat sound. That's why it's called the cat bird. So I imagine this is a combination. Also, it's interesting to note in this photograph um, in the upper right, this cat bird is eating a flower bud. It's not an item of uh, diet that, one, that most people think about for, for, for uh, birds. You know, we think about insects and fruit and seeds, but they also eat uh, buds sometimes. Uh, and uh, the northern mockingbird is one of my favorites. It also is one of the um, it, one of those mocking uh, uh, birds, of course. You know, mimicking birds. And uh, when you hear a bird repeating something, uh, that was several times in a row, wasn't it? And then a pause. So he repeats them. He repeats himself several times then pauses, and then says something else, and then pauses. N note it. Latin name, Mimus polyglottus. Many tongues. Mockingbirds sometimes sing in the middle of the night, uh, much to the consternation of people who are trying to sleep. I guess it, it's males who are desperate to find a mate at that point. Um, I have my own story to share about mockingbirds, by the way. Uh, I'm a musician, as I've mentioned previously, and uh, I was uh, in North Carolina many years ago and had the pleasure of playing with uh, a gentleman named Brother Yusuf Salim, who is a masterful piano player and composer, and I played in his sextet. Well, uh, several years ago, I knew that I heard that he was in a nursing home and, and probably not long for this world, so I decided to drive down and see him one last time. Uh, and I did go in to uh, visit him and uh, I gave him a massage and I also gave him what I call a verbal massage, which is suggestions for relaxation. And I gave him a nice peaceful trance experience. And then it was time for me to leave. So I went to my car. I knew I wouldn't see him again. I went to my car, I closed the door and a mockingbird flew down and perched on my side view mirror and stayed there. He did not sing, but he stayed there. <laughs> and what better bird than a mockingbird, which of course is quite remarkably musical um, and a, a true improviser as, and an imitator of other birds. What better bird to, to be an emissary. And what's interesting about the story is that Brother Yusuf Salim had not passed on at that point. So, uh, however, his spirit could well have left his body in the trance where, as I left him, uh, you know, his spirit could have left his body and either directed the bird to come to me or in, somehow inhabited the, the spirit and the body of that bird. Brown Thrasher is a different, uh, a, a, a yet another uh, member of this group, the mimicking. Uh, let's see. Yeah, one, two. 
Notice how thrashers only repeat themselves once, or usually only once. So if this was a mockingbird you were hearing, it would be several times in a row. But thrasher, you know, one repetition is usually enough. They are not nearly as common as the catbird and the mockingbird. Uh, last time I saw one was down in Virginia. And the starlings, we, we have a lot of, uh, I suppose, contempt for the starling because they're so numerous and they're, they're pests in many ways. But they are amazing. Now, these songs may not be appealing to you particularly, but they are remarkable. They make me think of the soundtrack of an Alfred Hitchcock movie. But one thing I would like to mention about starlings is that they are relatives of the minor bird and people sometimes have a starling as a pet in Europe. That's where they are native. They're, they're native to Europe. They're, they're an alien species here. They were brought to here by someone, brought to America by someone who decided for some reason that he wanted every bird mentioned by Shakespeare to come to America. Uh, and that was a mistake. Anyway, Mozart had a pet starling. And uh, this starling uh, was able to mimic his songs uh, and, he and the two of them were very close friends for life. And uh, at the end, there was, there's even a book, Mozart and his starling uh, that chronicles this relationship. When the starling passed away, uh, Mozart gave him a, a funeral with full regalia. Cedar waxwing, one of my favorite birds, fairly small, uh, beautiful birds. They, uh, they love fruit. And they have a fairly high pitched song. Yep. Wait a minute, that's not it. That's not it. Uh, let's see. Here it is Cedar Waxwing, high pitched song. Male on the right, female on the left. Cedar Waxwings can get drunk from eating too much fermented fruit. It's even been. Uh, when they, if they eat too much of it. Taking a long periods of time eating nothing but fruit, which is quite unusual for birds. Here's the uh, Bohemian waxwing. And my friend uh, Joe Oliverio, who lives here in Amherst, Massachusetts. I knew him before he was famous. All of this is Joe Oliverio's work. Now, there are many kinds of warblers in New England. I'm not going to be able to tell you all about all of them, of course, but I will play a few recordings. Here's the chestnut sided warbler saying, please, please, please to meet you. <laughs> the uh, yellow warbler. Sweet, sweet, sweet. I'm so sweet. The black and white warbler. Sounds like a squeaky wheel. We see, we see, we see, we see, we see. Unusual markings for birds. We see, we see, we see, we see. Common yellow throat, witchetty, witchetty. Bird with a black mask, but only the male has it. Witchetty. And the oven bird. Chirty, 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 chirty. Notice how it gets louder and louder, calling for the teacher. Chirty, 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 chirty. And it's called an oven bird because it has a nest on the uh, forest floor that reminds people of a Dutch oven. Uh, this bird looks like uh, a thrush, but it's not. It's actually a warbler. The bay-breasted warbler, the black-throated blue, the black-throated green, black pole, blue-winged warbler, northern parula. If you're a birder, these are all birds you want to have on your list. You want to be able to say, I saw a Cape May warbler. <laughs> Even the American red start is a warbler. Scarlet tanager is not a warbler. 
And isn't it remarkable how the male and the female look completely different? Hmm. And notice how the song sounds a little bit like a robin with a sore throat. Also, if you hear chick bird, chick bird, chick bird, and that's the scarlet tanager. And the rufous sided toey has perhaps the most comical song Drink your tea. Drink your tea. One of my favorites, the song sparrow. Mello spisa melodia. This is a truly, a true improviser. The song sparrow will just Pour forth concert of liquid gold. This uh, sonogram here, sometimes you hear the song sparrow saying something like, please, uh, maids, 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 please put the tea kettle on. This is a representation of that song, but isn't that a remarkable sonogram? How in the world is the bird uh, actually singing this range of pitches simultaneously? Also notice how, how jam-packed these uh, separate notes are to each other. They, they follow, they're almost on top of each other sequentially in, in that space of time. And th these are the kinds of details that it's impossible for our ears to hear. But I'm sure the female song sparrow listening to the male sing that way is truly impressed because that's what it's all about, is the male singing to the female uh, and impressing her with his virtuosity. Or in, in some cases, the males are impressing each other. White-throated sparrow. This is a sparrow that says, uh, oh, uh, old Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Old Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Of course, in Canada, they insist that the white-throated sparrow is saying, oh, sweet Canada, 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 Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and the Vesper Sparrow, another one, it's actually the Chipping Sparrow. I think, uh, let me skip over that. Um, here's the Vesper Sparrow. Fox sparrow. This is a fairly large sparrow, and it you can notice the very distinct uh, notes, a string of distinct notes. And fox, fox sparrows scratch in the soil. They scratch in the leaves, trying try to dislodge uh, something that they might find there <clears throat> that will be appetizing. The house sparrow uh, is uh, an invasive, an invasive bird, not, it's a non-native, non it does a lot of damage. It, it actually um, can displace other birds that are native. Uh, of course, you see quite a lot of them in urban uh, areas among the, the, the pigeons. Dark-eyed junco, a common denizen of uh, the, uh, you know, they're here already, actually. Um, they appear in the winter and they, they like to feed underneath the feeder, you know, with the, the seeds that have been dropped. They'll, they'll be foraging on the ground. Um, Northern Cardinal, now here's an exception. The female sings uh, her own songs and sometimes duets with the male. So sometimes they can be heard singing together.
here's somebody trying to be a cardinal. Please, uh, please mute yourself. Okay, so um, rose breast and gross beef. This is, uh, this is the bird that sounds like a robin that has taken singing lessons. So imagine, you know, the cheerly cheerio, cheerio, but sung with much more of a beautiful voice than the robin. Another bird that uh, has a very dramatic sexual dimorphism, the male and female was totally different. The male is all about being impressive. The female is all about camouflage. And uh, there's, there's also an evening gross beak. We don't see very many of them uh, these days. Their, their numbers have been, been reduced considerably. <coughs> Indigo bunting, what a beautiful bird this one is. And again, the, the female is all about camouflage. It's not a hint of that elegant blue. <clears throat> yeah, Di uh, Diane. Really busy? Yeah, I'm watching that bird program. I'm, I'm hearing. I'm hearing someone named Fred. Could Fred be, please? So, uh, Bobolink, look at this. With the um, uh, looks like he, uh, looks like he's wearing a tuxedo backwards. And I hear that if you were able to hear um, a slowed down recording of this song, you would be quite impressed with its complexity. Red winged blackbird might be the most common bird on the continent. They're often found in wetlands. And the male shows his epaulets when he has good reason to. Eastern meadowlark saying, spring of the earth, spring of the earth. Bird of the grasslands. Common grackle. Sometimes large flocks of grackles will descend on uh, on your lawn and then just with a and then suddenly leave for no reason, no apparent reason. The brown-headed cowbird. The male sounds like he's dropping a pebble in water. Listen, listen to this again. Uh, now, the brown headed cowbird happens to be uh, a, 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 a brood parasite, um, just like the ox, uh, um, ox catcher in, um, in, uh, in the Europe or Africa, I believe. Uh, what happens is that the, the, the female brown-headed cowbird does not know how to make her own nest, does not know how to take care of her own young. All she knows how to do is to lay her single solitary egg in the nest of another bird and, and while she's at it, uh, evict the other eggs so that her egg is the only one left. Now, uh, that egg will hatch and uh, uh, if, the, uh, if the mother bird whose nest that, that you know, belonging, <laughs> who has made that nest, perceives that chick to be its own, then you have, uh, then, it, then that cowbird chick has been adopted uh, and the mother has taken on responsibilities for feeding it. Here you have a picture of a chipping sparrow feeding what it presumes to be its chick, which is, as you can see, about twice its own size. And yet it's convinced, this is my baby, I've got to take care of it. And uh, uh, cowbirds can actually have significant impacts on bird populations uh, in a negative way, as you can imagine. Baltimore Oriole, one of my favorite birds, both the appearance, the, the, that beautiful orange and black and white coloration, and the song itself.
Orioles have a, a sweet tooth. If you put out a, a slice of orange or some, even some grape jelly, they'll, they'll be attracted to that. Isn't that a remarkable nest that the Oriole builds? Hmm. Purple finch. I don't know why it's called purple finch. It looks red to me. House finch. Looks like it dipped, dipped its head in red paint. Common red pole. Pine siskin. And finally, the American goldfinch. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> sounding like it's like he's saying potato chip. Potato chip. You'll see goldfinches flying, dipping up and down, their characteristic flight, up and down flight, and singing all the while, even while they fly. Goldfinches like thistle seeds. So uh, we've lost a lot of birds in my lifetime, uh, almost 3 billion birds. And there, in fact, there is a website that you can visit called Three Billion Birds, the number three. Uh, and you can learn about what, what has happened and what people are trying to do about it. 30% um, of our of birds have been lost since the 1970s. Two thirds of our birds could be gone by the end of this century. And it's not only the birds, all, all the animals. Uh, uh, recently, uh, it was shown the World Wildlife, World Wildlife Federation came out with a study that says we've lost 68% of our wildlife in that time period. Here are some of the birds that have been particularly hard, hard hit. Uh, Baltimore Orioles, we've lost two and five uh, since 1970. We've lost two and five uh, barn swallows since 1970. Nine in 10 evening gross beaks are gone since 1970. Three and four Eastern meadowlarks. Have, we've lost. And, and there it is, that website, 3billionbirds.org, and hashtag bring birds back. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert uh, has, has written this book about the sixth extinction, which we are in the middle of. And of course, this is uh, entirely due to human civilization, overpopulation and overconsumption. And we just have a short window of time in which to act to save this planet for not just wildlife, but, but ourselves as well. Uh, habitat loss is a big part of it. Industrial agriculture, residential sprawl, and commercial sprawl are all elements of habitat loss. If, if, an, if animals have no place to live, then their numbers decline. Uh, climate change also affects uh, uh, all of wildlife and, and plants as well. Uh, and it's important to note that uh, the impact of climate change or, or the, the uh, responsibility, I should say, for the change that has happened for the carbon emissions is primarily with the more developed nations and, and with the richest 10% um, responsible for 50% of the uh, total emissions. So it, it, it's uh, reasonable to assume then that uh, if we have a chance to survive, it's the richest uh, in the world who have to change their behavior and we have to perhaps convince them to do so. But you know, here in the, in, uh, in the developed world, Many of us are really part of the problem because if you have, uh, 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 if you are, if you have a net worth of ninety-three thousand uh, dollars, and many of us would say yes, that I'm in that category, uh, you are in fact part of the richest ten percent globally. So uh, one way we can turn down uh, the heat, so to speak, is by shopping less. Uh, here's a not shopping list: make make it instead of buying it, or repair, or repurpose, or borrow something swap, buy it secondhand, or just do without it. Uh, now I'd like to talk about some things that we can do in concrete ways to save birds in particular. Uh, there, a lot of birds fly into windows be, because they perceive that they are, uh, that, that what they see in a window is a reflection, of course, of the outside. And so they think that they can fly into that, what they perceive to be just more of their environment. And, and they can't. So decals. Uh, uh, acopian bird savers, screens, these are all uh, applications to windows that you can uh, consider. And you can do a, so uh, a, a search online for them. Cat predation is another huge, um, uh, it takes another, it takes a huge toll on bird populations. 
So it, it really is our responsibility to keep cats indoors uh, or you can make uh, uh, a catio, you know, a, an outdoor patio for cats, if you like. Rachel Carson uh, wrote the book Silent Spring and if she was still alive, she would say that yes, it still is an issue. Back in the day, she was talking about DDT as uh, being a chemical that was being used uh, uh, so wide, in, in such a widespread way that uh, the earthworms were in, ingesting it. And then that, uh, the birds that ate, the, ate those worms were uh, 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 laying eggs that wouldn't hatch because the eggs were so, eggshells were so thin. Uh, and it continues to be the case that agricultural pesticides kill many birds and is a major source of bird mortality. Uh, don't buy neonicotinoids. These are lethal for both birds and pollinators, which are so essential to the ecosystem. Birds need food, water, shelter, and a place to rear their young. So we can feed the birds and we can, uh, we can make our own bird feeders for that matter. As you can see in this example, you can do a search for homemade bird feeders. Here's an interesting approach for a bird feeder. Uh, or you can buy one. Um, there are squirrel proof bird feeders, incidentally. Here are some ways to keep them out with the, you know, baffles and the like. Here's specially designed so they can't get a purchase. Uh, one of the best designs, I think, is a simple uh, window mounted feeder uh, because you can monitor it carefully. You can see if it needs to be cleaned. You get a great view of them. They're right there close to you. Uh, it also would be bear proof if you have it up on a window in most cases. If you have a feeder outside and bears are an issue, place them at least 10 feet off the ground, 10 feet from anything bears can climb and keep area under the feeder clean. And it's gonna have to be a pretty strong pull. If you'd like, you can make yourself some suet. And in fact, uh, and the nut butter and the uh, cornmeal, uh, those two ingredients would be sufficient. But here's uh, a, a rep recipe from audubon.org. Uh, with other ingredients that will attract them. Uh, don't, you, don't allow the suet to be out if it's above 50 degrees for an extended period of time because it'll turn rancid. And speaking of homemade ways to provide needs for a bird, well, here's, here are some low budget bird feeders, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, bird, uh, bird baths for them to either drink or to take a bath in. Uh, please don't feed birds bread. Uh, many of us grew up thinking that it was uh, uh, a helpful thing to do to, you know, toss breadcrumbs to, to uh, ducks or to uh, waterfowl or the like. Uh, it's not true because they are heavily processed, contain preservatives, contain little protein, lack fat and lack protein. Those are the things that birds need. And this is the consequence of birds eating too much of that junk food that we think is going to, be, going to uh, feed them angel wing deformity. This bird is not able to fly. Uh, approved for foods for songbirds include, of course, uh, the, the seeds that you can buy in the store, plus any of these foods. Eggshells. And please consider landscaping for birds and landscaping for nature in general. Uh, it can certainly bring you many hours of beauty and uh, the wonder of nature. And I, I'm not entirely opposed to lawns. Lawns have their place, but in most cases we have far too much lawn. And, uh, and if we manage it with, uh, um, if we expect too much of our lawns, if we expect perfection, then it's gonna uh, consume a lot of resources and have a major environmental impact. Uh, now, if you'd like to uh, say, uh, okay, I've got more lawn than I need, or even if you have an area where there's uh, poison ivy or some weeds that you want to get rid of. Well, you give everything a close shave, a haircut, and then uh, put and then soak it and then put down cardboard and soak that and then uh, add mulch or add compost and then mulch. And you've just created a garden. It's called lasagna gardening because you have layers now of organic matter that will all decompose. Um, and these, these projects look pretty uh, uh, large scale, but you can do sheet mulching on a smaller scale if you like. And, and you can see in the lower right hand picture, you can use a newspaper instead of cardboard uh, as the barrier layer. Mulch uh, as the top layer because it, it, keep, it keeps the soil cool and moist and it prevents seeds from sprouting. Here are some types of mulch you can use for annual beds, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, pine straw. 
And you can use either of those in perennial beds as well, but sometimes pine bark sawdust wood chip, chips or chip branch wood are more uh, long lasting. Uh, you, you will definitely want to get rid of invasive plants. This one featured here is the um, oriental bittersweet and uprooting is the way to go in many cases, uh, but cutting and repeated mowing or repeated cutting back of plants or smothering can often be effective in removing invasive plants. And here is the rogue gallery of invasive plants that you wanna be aware of. Garlic mustard, here's that oriental bittersweet, black swallowwort, Japanese knotweed, autumn olive, bush honeysuckle, common barberry, goutweed, common buckthorn, glossy buckthorn, multiflora rose, burning bush, sycamore maple, and Norway maple. None of those belong on your property. Please try to get rid of them and replace them with native uh, plants. Now, poison ivy happens to be a native, and there's nothing wrong with it being in, in the woods. But I understand if you want to eliminate it from your property. Uh, birds, incidentally, can eat those um, fruits of the poison ivy. And in fact, the, those little berries, those little white berries are a source of nutrition in the middle of winter for them. And speaking of nutrition, caterpillars are key, especially if you're uh, a mother trying to feed your chicks, because caterpillars are, are just packed with protein and fat and all the things little birds need. They're soft, so they're easy for those chicks to digest. So it's, it's an ideal baby food for chicks. Uh, and a mother chickadee needs to find seven or eight or 9,000 caterpillars uh, uh, to, to raise that brood of chicks. Uh, so Doug Tallamy is the author of Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope. He's a scientist who has demonstrated conclusively that um, you, you just don't get those caterpillars visiting non-native trees or shrubs or vegetation, not nearly as much as the natives. That's because the, the caterpillars um, have, broken, have, have figured out how to, uh, uh, you know, over evolution, they've cracked the code, the, the genetic code, and whatever chemical defenses the native plants have, well, the, the caterpillars have been around long enough, so they have uh, adapted and they can eat those, uh, those leaves anyway. But if you bring in those non-native plants, caterpillars don't know what to do. They, you know, they, they can't handle it. So uh, we might think of uh, ornamentals as being beautiful, but if they're, uh, if they're not um, feeding wildlife, uh, they're, they're really uh, taking up space that needs to be devoted to the two birds. So here's a, a starter list from Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, allaboutbirds.org. It's a wonderful website, by the way. You can learn a lot about birds, about any kind of bird. A lot of the recordings uh, are, are available there. Best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for birds, a starter list. And oak is number one because there are so many caterpillars that visit an oak tree, so many different kinds. Mulberry is a fruit that is delicious, absolutely delicious to birds. In fact, I love them too, so I understand why. Uh, it's a messy tree. You don't want it planted over your sidewalk or driveway, but if you've got a corner of your yard to put it, the birds will thank you and you will enjoy seeing them flock to that tree. Sassafras has edible fruit for birds. So does Juneberry, a beautiful tree in your landscape. Those fruits taste just as good as blueberries, in my opinion. Elderberry, another you know, you, could, uh, you can call, this is a native plant and it's an ornamental, uh, but why not call it an ornithomental? Ornitho ornithology, of course, is the study of birds. So if you call it an ornithomental, that means it's beautiful and it's uh, feeding the birds. Uh, and I'll, I'll go a, a few steps further. If it's also providing uh, nectar uh, and pollen for pollinators, well, then it's an ento ornithomental. And for that matter, because it's medicinal and edible for humans, it's medicinal because it's a fantastic way to boost your immune system. And, and it's great if you have the flu, elderberry syrup. Those uh, fruits are delicious for people to eat. You can put them in your, uh, you make elderberry pancakes or elderberries in your oatmeal or what have you. So now we have a medi eddy ento ornithomental plant. And uh, ornamentals can't stand, uh, don't, can't hold a candle to an eddy, medi, ento, ornithomental. <laughs> well, how about viburnums? All, all those viburnums have uh, fruit that's edible for birds. Mm -hmm. So do the dogwoods. So does staghorn sumac in late winter. So does the spice bush. Hawthorn, a beautiful tree, has daggers for thorns, but boy, those, those fruits are good. 
crab apple likewise uh, edible for birds so is holly not edible for people but is it is edible for birds uh, black cherry and choke cherry and and all the the blueberries the huckleberries the blackberries northern bayberry in, in late winter is a, a valuable source for birds when everything else is gone and even the uh, Conifers, some, some of them have edible seeds. They provide cover, they provide shelter, they provide nesting sites, and sometimes even uh, some larvae for those hungry birds. Uh, and here's a ground cover, bearberry, also edible for birds. So is wintergreen. Uh, and then, if, not surprisingly, the, the seeds of the sunflower, uh, if those uh, squirrels and chipmunks don't get to them first. And, uh, but it's not just the sunflower, the seeds of black-eyed Susan, the seeds of purple coneflower. Notice these are all related. These are in the um, daisy family, if you will, uh, the Asteraceae. So a lot of those, uh, uh, if, you, if you leave these flowers, instead of, you know, being, uh, 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 you know, so uh, too focused on being neat, why not uh, leave your, perennial standing through the, the uh, fall. That way, uh, s birds will come and find uh, seeds to eat. Also, the insects will find uh, uh, some refuge and some places to uh, deposit their eggs and that sort of thing. And then in the spring, you can do your spring cleanup. Birds also eat the seeds of these flowers. And again, almost all of them, ex with the exception of the sedum, uh, every, every other plant on this page is a member of the aster family, the asteraceae. All decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. So we're ending as we began with the wisdom of the uh, first peoples, uh, indigenous um, Native Americans. Uh, and we need to be thinking about the welfare of future generations of, uh, of humans and, and of animals. We only have one planet, there is no planet B. Uh, I'm going to end this pro program now with a couple of uh, illustrations which might be quite remarkable to you. These are uh, called crop circles, but as you can see, there's, they're a lot more sophisticated than just circles. And you can see also that the uh, swallow has been represented. Uh, there are three of them in this uh, crop formation from 2003. There are 12 of them here in 2008, and this one actually occurred on two successive nights. Crop formations usually happen in the middle of the night. They happen in a matter of seconds. And I have an entire presentation called Majesty and Mystery of Crop Circles. I think that they're worth paying attention to. I don't think that people are making them. And the reason I don't is because the, the plants are not being, are not mechanically bent in the farmer's fields. They are actually being bent by some mysterious energy that directs them not only, not, not only which plants to bend to create the pattern, but also, uh, in their particular, their bent in particular directions to add to the artistic effect of them. Uh, and if we are being visited by uh, a civilization that is uh, arguably much more intelligent and perhaps more spiritually advanced than we are, perhaps we have something to learn from them. Uh, and if we can uh, perhaps think of ourselves as being, uh, having the courage to be open to making contact, uh, much as we should have the courage to get along with uh, people here on this planet who are different, look different from us, uh, perhaps we have something important to learn from them. And that certainly is some kind of message that we see here, but no one has decoded it. Well, uh, thus ends my presentation of Songbirds of the Northeast, and I'd be happy to hear any comments or questions.